finding the value of expressions with exponents. Let's look at some examples. In this problem we have negative 4 to the third power. We use the parentheses to show that the negative 4 is to the third. So we have to multiply negative 4 times negative 4 times negative 4. A negative 4 times a negative 4 is a positive 16. A positive 16 times a negative 4 is a negative 64. So our answer for negative 4 to the third is negative 64. This may lead you to believe that if you have a negative, the answer is always negative using exponents. But that is not true. Let's look at our second example and find out why. Negative 5 to the fourth power means negative 5 times negative 5 times negative 5 times negative 5. If we group these, the negative 5 times negative 5 is positive 25. And a negative 5 times a negative 5 again is positive 25. And 25 times 25 is positive 625. So in this case, although we started with a negative base, we came out with a positive answer. What you need to realize is that when we start with a negative base, if the exponent is odd, your answer should be negative. If the exponent is even, your answer will come out positive. Let's continue down our examples. 8 to the third. That means 8 times 8 times 8. 8 times 8 is 64, so we need 64 times 8. And 64 times 8 is 512. So 8 to the third is 512. If I look at this one, 2 thirds to the third power. 2 thirds times 2 thirds times 2 thirds. It's the entire fraction. 2 times 2 times 2. Multiply the numerators is 8. 3 times 3 times 3 is 27. So 2 thirds to the third power is 8 27ths. Remember, if the entire fraction is in parentheses, you use the entire fraction the number of times the exponent says. 10 to the third is 10 times 10 times 10. 10 times 10 is 100 times another 10 gives me 1,000. 10 to the third is 1,000. Is it a coincidence that we have three zeros with an exponent of three? I think not you will see that exponents of 10, or powers of 10, this will always happen. So 10 to the fourth would have four zeros, 10 to the fifth would have five zeros, and so on. Let's look at this one. We have a fraction, but the entire fraction is not in parentheses. We have four to the second over three to the third. This means we're going to take the four times four in the numerator, and the 3 times 3 times 3 in that denominator. 4 times 4 is 16. 3 times 3 times 3 is 27. So we get 16 27 as our answer to 4 to the second over 3 to the third. So compare this one to our next one where the entire fraction is once again in parentheses. 1 half times 1 half times 1 half. This 3 is for the entire fraction. 1 times 1 times 1 is 1. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. So 1 half to the third power equals 1 eighth. Let's look at our last example. This example has a negative 4 fifths, a fraction inside the parentheses, but the base is negative. So let's think back to what we learned in our first two examples. If we have a negative base and the exponent is odd, we get a negative answer. 
If we have a negative base and the exponent is even, we get a positive answer. In our last example, we have a negative base with an odd exponent. By using this rule, negative base, odd exponent, we should get a negative answer. This is a good way to check our work when we're finished. We also have a fraction entirely in parentheses. So we know we have to take that entire fraction. Negative 4 fifths times negative 4 fifths times negative 4 fifths. Notice that we can write the negative sign in front of the fraction, in the numerator, or even in the denominator. It does not matter, the entire fraction is still negative. Let's multiply by grouping these two. A negative times a negative is a positive. 4 times 4 is 16. 5 times 5 is 25. I now have to multiply that by negative 4 fifths. A positive times a negative gives me a negative answer. 16 times 4 is 64. 25 times 5 is 125. Remember in my rule, negative base, odd exponent, I did get a negative answer, so I can double check that way. My answer for negative 4 fifths to the third power is negative 64 120 fifths. Working with exponents is not difficult, but there is room for many careless mistakes. So work carefully and you'll be fine. Many wind farms are springing up across the world in order to convert wind power to electricity. The wind makes the blades turn, the blades turns the turbine, and the turbine converts the mechanical energy into electrical power. Obviously, the speed of the wind and the diameter and area of the blades of the windmill determine the amount of electricity. Let's look at the standard formula for calculating expected energy from a wind turbine. This is the formula that I got from, this, from the internet when I looked on the internet about the wind power and notice what it says. The effects of large scale and small scale turbulence on the power output of a small horizontal axis wind turbine. And so the web has a lot of information. And this is the formula that they had. Power equals one half P A over velocity cubed. And P is density of air. Now remember, if you have those wind turbines at sea level, and some of them have them like in the, in the ocean, but there's some on top of mountains, and the air gets thinner. So air gets thinner at high elevations. So that is put into the formula, the density of, of air. A equals the area determined by the blade diameter. So that's also important, the area. How big is the blade? How much area does it have? And V, obviously, is the wind velocity. And wind velocity is cubed. But I just want to show you that Algebra is used all over. And if you're going to work on wind turbines, you have to know algebra to work in that kind of a field. Please pause the video now and complete the problems in your workbook. When finished, press play and we'll continue with the next lesson.